So I feel like this this show has changed tone dramatically. It's become more artful in its composition. I don't know how to explain it. On the plus side, Kanut may be gone, but at least we have a woman to be the stake. The king seems to be in two places at once about Canute. I mean, clearly cares about him, loves him a great deal. Also, is making kind of cold and calculated decisions about what he does. And a little bit of disappointment as well in there. Are those sword scars? I guess becoming Viking king is not a peaceful affair. I'm so excited for Canute's story. The groundwork has been laid so perfectly because he's just such a nothing with so much pressure, so many obligations. There's such a long and exciting climb ahead of him. Part of the thrill of watching it and maybe even just the thrill of watching anybody take on these sorts of impossible climbs out of patheticness is that you know that there's a very real possibility that it will never happen, that nothing ever will come out of them. And it's something that will only happen if they choose it for themselves and battle their way upwards. And there's also this extra danger of the fact that the path they would like to climb up is to us clearly not the best path for Canute. Like, is the goal to please his father? That would not nearly be as satisfying as Canute just sort of taking charge of his own life and doing what he wants. Being able to have a voice. Oh, After Yule, episode 15. It's break time. More break. Thorkel's also a poet, but he's not busy smashing people with trees. Yes. <laughs> exactly. I like how just some, someone threw a cup at a wall and that was the end of that. <laughs> Let's call it a day. Another keg. <laughs> There's not enough beer in the land. Marth? Are they? Oh, they're not paying for it, of course. Whoever is employed as a horn maker must make a killing. The richest man in the land. Know the feeling. Always looking for another battle. Wow, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> That's what? Oh, they're capitulating? Where does Thorkel go next then? It's not fair that they just have this one random superhero in this in this show. Yeah, hard to imagine that the aftermath of the trauma they experienced last episode. I have so much respect for the priest now. Just that simple gesture of him trying to warn the villagers, knowing the risk. I continue to be fascinated by the, the previous episode. It's laying the groundwork, sort of the moral structure of the show, in ways that are kind of too big for me to understand yet. After watching, I saw this great uh, Instagram reel or TikTok video, I can't remember where I saw it. It was really beautifully put, and I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like, there are only two religions on Earth. One is to look to the highest good you can possibly imagine and try to align yourself with it. And in doing so, a lot of things become clear. You know, the, the daily realities or grievances become more manageable in, in pursuit of the greatest good or, you know, the highest form of you living towards the good that you see and following the principles that get you there as best you can. By proceeding in that way and having faith in that process, you can become like God yourself or you can, you know, be sort of an embodiment of God. The other is to go in the opposite direction and to look downwards to the smallest thing, to sort of lose yourself in a point of focus on things like the breath or sounds or whatever the case may be. In doing so, you can become so aligned with reality that you're able to chart a, a path that is in harmony with existence and with yourself, becoming so aware that you can become like God or embody God or you know, perhaps meet God. Both of them look in different directions, but the underlying concept is similar. You know, it's kind of looking beyond yourself as the highest point. Not to dispense with yourself, but to better align yourself in thought and action with the best thing you could be to fit the grandness that is existence. And it's interesting to look at villains in this way, because I think one major commonality between 
villains who do really horrible things in media is they don't really have something higher than themselves. They're, they're not really seeing beyond kind of what is of their own selves and their own creation. And they're missing the, the greater influence. Great example of that would be Father in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I mention this because I'm really wondering about Askla. You know, I've been thinking a lot about his actions and the fact that he's so amazing. He's so cool. He like navigates this circumstantial reality so well. Where does it go wrong? And I can't help but wonder if that's part of the significance of the fact that he believes Valhalla is coming. You know, there's like, there's, there's nothing else. There's no greater thing. It's just like how far you can push it in your life. And maybe it's just the, the people you care about or the group you care about, maybe his mother and the Welsh people perhaps, or just his own life and his ambition and what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish, power he wants to feel is sort of the highest thing that he can aim at. He's very convicted in that. And that allows him to do seemingly impossible things. But the show I think is making a very clear distinction that that is not the answer. And I think they kind of gave their answer in the beginning with Thor's. And now it's like a lot of these characters are trying to fill the, the vacuum created by Thor's, you know, trying to catch up to his greatness while there are all these counteracting forces trying to reject it or resist it. And one thing I've kind of struggled with is that I know that people who are aiming at terrible things can feel the same kind of connectedness and greatness and grandness that people experience when they strive for the best things. You'll be rewarded internally for a feeling of movement towards any grand goal, no matter what the goal is. You know, people who are doing terrible things at a very large scale that requires hard work and they you know, they really believe in it, they all feel alive and they'll feel great doing it, which makes it really confusing when they do terrible things. Because it's like, how can people like that be so inspirational or so so amazing? It's because there's, there's separate things. There's like the pursuit of the goal and the self-mastery and discipline and connection to one's own purpose. And then there's the quality of that goal and how good it'll be and how withstanding is it and how honest is it. And that's where heroes come in because they take that and they like rise one level above it where it's not just their own personal struggle towards any goal. It's their own personal struggle and overcoming challenges towards the best goal or at least the best goal we have in any given story. The real hero of the story after Thor's has yet to emerge and it'll be someone who can do both. Oh, and also about last episode, I think there was a parallel being drawn between Anne and Asklad because Anne was focused on the earthly possession of the ring. Yeah. Speaking of like rejecting the, the greater glory for your own personal ambitions and motivation. Oh. I don't blame him, but Canute getting a voice. I wonder wh where this is actually coming from. Ah, interesting. This feels more like Knut's conformity rather than actual deep expression of love. It feels more like his own fear. Yeah, there we go. Doubt. Big doubt from Knut. <laughs> He's the most afraid of all. But at least he, you know, showed some backbone. Thorfinn just can't... Can't get it? Can he get it? The knife that his father grabbed. Yeah. Remembering Thor's sacrifice. Trying to keep him out of the out of his whole life. Oh, was it Anne? Anne! It makes a return, speaking of which. Sorry we threw a glass at you earlier. <laughs> I love this bar background as people passed out. Ooh, something about the anticipation of this snowy battle is making me really, really thrilled. <laughs> this is your service as a warrior. Not all men carry swords. Some just pack lunchboxes. A lot of lunchboxes. Man, Thorkel is just a force of terror. I love it. He's been so well set up. Ears can hear Thorkel from that bar way out there. Just a communal piss. <laughs> piss bros. That's like always two steps ahead. Nothing good can come out of Thorkel planning. Someone's going to take a, a hit. Someone's going to be sacrificed. Huh, are the men losing faith a little bit? Aslad is aware of this though. He knows. He probably knows exactly where his men's lines are. Oh no, that cute rabbit! I knew it was... I knew that was gonna happen. Thorfinn's diet consists mainly of rabbits and loneliness. What was that expression? I just love cooking rabbit. What is with the delicious soup in this show? Everything's soup. Are we... Are we becoming friends? 
そなたのウサギだ。What is this feeling? Eating with other people and not just, you know, in a cold rainy boat. <laughs> I can already sort of see how this, this sort of outsider crew in Asclad's party can be really helpful for Thorfinn. They're new, so they don't have that sort of stain of the tragedy of Thorfinn's childhood. They're also kind of unwilling participants just here by circumstance and bad luck. So that can allow Thorfinn to let down his guard a little bit and actually have bonds. Just be with people. Like he's just been so out of touch. You need to have your hands touching things that ground you to, you know, not just your brain. I think about that. A lot. It's, it's insidious, and I don't even realize how insidious it is until I return to normalcy. You know, if I'm alone for a long time, or I'm not having certain kinds of conversations with people, my mind and, and beliefs start to warp a little bit. I feel like I'm not really a reliable source of generating wisdom. I think that things work best when I have my hands on something that has greater energy than myself, and then that energy is immediately transferred to me through osmosis, and then it's up to me to kind of abstract it and make it meaningful to me through cognition or whatever. But isolation is a really terrible thing. And it's not just being alone. It's like not being grounded to certain necessary things that are bigger than you or greater than you or just good. So that's what this scene feels like for me and Thorfinn. You know, it's like finally a connection, you know, something else besides just his loneliness and misery. <laughs> his eyelashes are so beautiful. It's a bit harsh. <laughs> At least he didn't like blast fire in your face. Look at this just normal dinner. Normal dinner with people. This is happening so quickly. <laughs> The villager sacrifice was for nothing. Not that it wouldn't have been terrible either way. <laughs> I don't know. Ragnar's proven that he's not he's no slouch, he can fight. I think Aslan has a few surprises up his sleeve still. Ragnar might be around to witness it. Oh no! What are they doing? Are they taking out Ragnar? No! <gasps> what the hell? Why? They got that sick of his complaining? They just want more influence with Canute? They did him so dirty. Oh man, right after that, that beautiful dinner scene! You just can't trust, you can't have any happy moments in anime. Just never fight. I'm guessing it's for Canute's safety. I'm guessing in his last moments, he's going to be thinking about Canute still. There he is. He oversaw this personally. Oh. That's all Canute has, it seems. Yeah, it was for influence with Canute. This is someone who really, really loves Canute. He's not even angry. He's just like, please take care of him. Wow, there's troubles at home even. Harold. And Harold is the prodigal son. Everyone is using Canute. And he has to make a choice, right? Whoa! Whoa! Oh my god! I had no idea it was that extent. That's why he did that. That's why he sent him against London. When Canute finds this out, this is going to be devastating, but also maybe great. He's all alone. It's just him and what he can do. That makes Asclad's mi mission job a whole lot harder as well. He thought he had leverage, but he has an obstacle. He has a, a loose end in his possession. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen, but oh god.
ってんか一緒に鳥料理でもきっと王陛下も喜んで He's been carrying the secret himself too this whole time trying to protect Canute from that too but there's just no protecting him didn't realize I liked Ragnar that much until he died. Well, I knew somebody was going to get sacrificed. I didn't see that coming. Should have seen it coming. Uh, Ragnar was obviously an obstacle between Aslan and Canute. It was only a matter of time in hindsight. It's so apparent that Ragnar's fatal flaw from the beginning was love. You know, he just loved in a way that couldn't let go. And that included kind of deceiving himself in a sense. You know, that through his sheer willpower and love alone, he could protect Canute from the horrors of the world, not realizing that there is no protecting Canute. Only Canute can protect Canute. He kind of died for that mistake, trying to push the evil outside of their collective thinking to try to live in these happy moments like the soup scene. But the devil is coming to your door. In this case, it was Asklad, but there's a lot of other threats coming Canute's way. And he is just not equipped, man. I was talking about having a, a huge mountain to climb. It just got a lot bigger because now he has no one and even his own father is against him. But at the same time, I feel like that might prove to be his salvation because as I was saying, part of what would make his journey satisfying and what kind of needs to happen for him to be anything like a heroic character is for him not to rise into this neatly allotted framework of what people want for him. It's for him to rise into heroism for who he is and what he wants. And now the rails he was on have been destroyed. It's just chaos, but there's also a lot of potential for him there to be whatever, you know, to form a new perception of what that is, you know, speaking of the highest good or connecting yourself to the highest image of greatness you can imagine. He can't aim at pleasing his father anymore once he learns of, you know, this plot. Although, I'm curious what Aslan will do because it's still possible Asclad will try to push Canute into something that allows him to get legitimacy and claim the throne, despite what Sven is currently thinking. And Sven, being in charge of a kingdom and not wanting to split and being obviously a tactician himself, might be amenable. You know, he might be able to switch sides. He might be able to choose Canute if Asclad is able to create something grand enough or create a narrative around him that inspires enough support. I'm not really sure what other plan there would be for Asclad right now. Canute is his big playing piece. So how does he try to push Canute from where he is now to where he wants him to be? And and then, importantly for Canute, how does Canute take advantage of that without becoming Asclad or becoming just a worse evil or, you know, just another evil?